very much mindful of how chilly it is in Berlin right now. I see Thomas is wearing his, almost his Bernie Sanders mittens, um, keeping his hands <laughs> warm. <laughs> it's like, sorry, it's going yeah, to um, But just a, a very quick little introduction to help you set the scene and get the bearings of the whole bit. Obviously, most of us are familiar with the great iconic sites of Berlin, you know, Brandenburg Gate, the Reichstag building. In fact, if uh, any of you had joined us in September when we did the tour in totally different weather, beautiful blue sky, you would have seen most of those iconic sites. But like most of the great cities of the world, and Berlin is one of the great cities of the world, there are multiple layers of history and culture and sites within that city. And one of the beauties of having Thomas in Berlin, that we can explore these different areas. And the one in particular is this Jewish heritage, uh, Jewish quarter, we've called it, but technically there was never a definitely defined, it wasn't, it wasn't a ghetto, it wasn't, the Jewish population wasn't confined just to this one area. However, there's so much history within this one area that we thought it was well worth exploring with Thomas. So he's gonna be leading us through to enjoy that. In fact, Berlin has played a pivotal role in the history of modern Judaism, the evolution of the um, reformation of modern Judaism, and Thomas will talk about that as we go on. Just to help you get your bearings, I just want to share a couple of screens with you just to show you exactly where we are uh, located at the moment. Uh, this LC is an aerial view of Greater Berlin, just to help you get your bearings. We've got the large image of uh, Berlin, the Tear Garden, the west of the city, the Brandenburg Gate, Unter den Linden, the beautiful avenue leading up to the heart of the city. This large area being Museum Island and where the former Royal Palace and is now being reconstructed, the Humboldt Forum, and heading into what was then the former East Berlin, and just about where that where we are now, this is where Thomas is standing right now with the rather um, iconic television tower in East Berlin standing there behind him. Just a little bit closer up the area we are going to be looking at today. Again, his Museum Island, uh, the Berliner Hof, and Thomas is standing just here. And we're going to be leading through this area um, into the Hackish Market area, the Hackish Hof. Hack courtyards, the Hackish Market area, through past several vitally important historic Jewish sites. And we've finished the tour at the new synagogue here. So without much ado, I'll now hand over to Thomas. Um, take it away, Tom. First and foremost, good morning to all of you in Australia. Uh, good evening to all of you in Australia. Here we have a lovely but rather cold and wonderful morning here in Berlin. Not only um, am I greeting you from Berlin on my own behalf, but also on behalf of Katinka, our wonderful camera person, and also a very accomplished guide and educator here in Berlin. We're looking forward to our time together this morning, and we are honored to be with Academy Travel and all of you as we explore what can be considered truly a Jewish heritage in Berlin. Now, as Stuart has suggested, we are very close to the world famous Unter den Linden, and we are very much in a historical center of Berlin. If you look directly behind me, you should be able to see a large red brick building with a red brick tower and a clock. That is from the 1860s, the Berlin Town Hall, where our city government meets and convenes. It is, however, situated on its historical medieval uh, position in the city of Berlin. That is also confirmed to us via the Church of St. Mary, just really just more immediately behind me from the 15th century, the lovely Church of St. Mary, and then coming over even further east, the iconic Berlin television tower from 1969, 365 meters tall, one meter for every day of the year. We are also in the former East Berlin, the former Soviet sector. And in very recent times, there has been a rebuild of the Berlin Palace, where the electors of Brandenburg lived, later the kings of Prussia, later the German emperors. And in the distance, looking down Unter den Linden, you will notice a beautiful uh, golden, well, it's sandstone dome or bronze dome that you see there in the distance. That is the rebuild of the Berlin Palace, which shall become, or already is, what is known as the Humboldt Forum, the newest museum 
at Museum Island. It shall house art of the non-Western world. And that should give us a little bit of a geography and an orientation and a, and a topography of where we are here in Berlin as we begin our explorations. Now, the Berlin Jewish community had existed with really rather mysterious origins in the 13th century. They were situated behind the Berlin Town Hall, the red brick building that we just indicated to you. They were, in, they were situated on a north-south trading route that is called the Via Imperialis, the Imperial Road. And the Imperial Road then connected the north, the Baltic. So think later the Hanseatic League. Some of you perhaps have been studying that with Matt. And then going, going all the way down to Prague and eventually over to Santiago to Compostela. The, so they're on a trading route. And that's uh, 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 medieval Jewish Berlin. Traders, they are trading in, in particular, wool. The, and those, that medieval community comes to an end in rather unhappy circumstances in 15, 1571. And there was a, a time of exactly 100 years in which there was no Jewish presence in Berlin. And in 1671, 1671, the Elector of Brandenburg recognizes that the Jewish community in Vienna is being persecuted. The, and they are being forced out of Vienna. And when this happens, the so-called Great Elector, 1671, the Elector of Brandenburg, the prince here in Berlin, recognizes that this is happening. And he recognizes that the Thirty Years' War had been so devastating for Berlin, for Brandenburg, that those wonderful Jewish families most of whom were again trading in textiles and had established very intensive uh, partnerships going from Vienna into further east into Europe, need, uh, need protection. And he invites them up to Berlin and they arrive. And when they arrive into Berlin, they recognize that they are able to be uh, situated very close to the royal palace, just in the shadow of the palace. They are also, they're situated right here. And then they are situated very close, the shadow of the Church of St. Mary, very close to the Berlin Town Hall. Not far, but not in that area where the earlier Jewish community had existed. The, and of course, when you arrive in, and there's very little or in, no infrastructure that would have a Jewish Heritage Association with it, they begin to live in this area right here where we are. And they have a series of smaller homes. And in those homes are what's called a bait house or private chapel for service. And only in 1713, but nonetheless, and of course, this is what the community has been striving for, they will create a synagogue. Now, this synagogue was always a little bit back into the courtyards. We're approaching one of the walls of it. Careful, Katika, not that you trip. The, and, the, and so relatively small, a beautiful classical building, most of which was subterranean, but nonetheless open. You could see it as a classical building. And that uh, synagogue was heavily damaged in the course of World War II. It had already become rather dilapidated, having been replaced in relevance by what is called the new synagogue. And that's where we will be spending some time as well. So this became known as the old synagogue. This subterranean aspect, a little bit back in the courtyard, it's very typical of synagogue architecture and positioning throughout all of Europe. Don't make our presence too well known or too uh, clear, but at the same time, we are able to have some security and a place of worship for our community. Now, in the course of the 1980s, in the former East Berlin, there was a greater effort on the memorialization of both Jewish heritage and um, the, perse the persecution and the Holocaust as well. And a result of that is if we look down here, I think Katinka is showing the camera. Yeah, you notice, it might be a little hard to see, but you notice that um, there are these gray stones, these gray blocks. And these gray blocks indicate to us the outline of the synagogue. Here, the outline of the entrance, the foyer to the synagogue, which in itself was not, was really rather substantial. And then it carried on physically to where you see that fence, that uh, fence and those trees just in the background. So that establishes 1671, the synagogue opens in 1713. 
with a royal visit. The this area has been very much associated with a Berlin Jewish community. Those wonderful Viennese, very brave and courageous Viennese families walking all the way from Vienna to Berlin. And that's a distance. And associated with the synagogue eventually then becomes a series of social institutions, kindergartens, um, kosher food stores, things of that nature. And just where Katinka and I are now standing, or where I am now standing, the synagogue physically would be just behind me, right here was the back wall of a building built in the 1880s. And this building was built as part of that infrastructural process. And it was the home of the Berlin Jewish Community Social Services. And this building was utilized in 1943 in a choreographed action of the Third Reich referred to as the factory action. Well, let's get into that terminology. The word factory action is referring to the fact that on the 27th of February, 1943, which is the 10th anniversary of the burning of the Reichstag, this is, there's a great intentionality to this choreographed factory action. And on that day, and evening in all three factory shifts, morning, evening, night, the SA, uh, pardon me, the SS and the Gestapo, and they are really the organizers of both the incarceration process of Jewish persons throughout Germany, but also the deportations as well. They go on that day and they literally round up throughout all of Germany. So it's very choreographed all persons of German Jewish heritage or Jewish heritage period who are working in in particular ammunitions factories. They've been work detailed into these factories. And on that day, they're all rounded up. And in Berlin, there is a literally a collecting of 11,000 Jewish men in particular. Now those 11,000 Jewish men 2,000 will be taken into this building here, the Berlin Jewish Social Services Institute or building, where they will experience an incarceration. The, but these 2,000 men were slightly singularized out from the other 11,000. They were married to, Ger I will say, German-German women. They were, or better said, non-Jewish partners, or they may have had a non-Jewish um, parent. And so they're slightly singularized out. And when this occurs, women, their wives, maybe their mothers, begin to come down to the street that we'll be walking on in just a minute, and they protest. And this is referred to as the women's protest or the Rosenstrasse protest, which lasted 10 days. There was, needless to say, absolutely no uh, news information going out about this civil protest. Some of the ladies bring new clothes for their husbands. Some of them bring food. And eventually, all 2,000 of these men will be released. However, in the course of the next 18 months, many will very sadly be deported and murdered in either Theresienstadt or Auschwitz. And in 1988, the city of East Berlin uh, created a memorial to the events of 1943, and the, in particular, the women's protests in the framework of the act, fa factory action. And this lovely memorial here with this beautiful red sandstone, which is so evocative, was created by an East German artist, female artist named um, Inga Hunziger. And just very briefly, it's very typical of uh, artistic processes of the former East Germany and socialist Europe that it is quite readable. So all of a sudden I begin to see here a group of presumably women together with a child and perhaps standing on the street, looking over to a separated block where all of a sudden I begin to see, and I think Katinka is doing a lovely panorama, a group of men just right here, incarcerated behind these slashing uh, uh, barriers. Significantly, those men are beginning to escape, or not escape, but be released from those barriers into the arms of, oh, pardon me, into the arms of this 
uh, uh, woman, this person waiting for these men to arrive out again. Above the woman, a typical uh, Judaic heritage, the menorah, and next to that, a rather stylized crown of David. So we begin to see that though there is very little evidence of this history, that Berlin ascertains that this memory is now visualized for us. So I would like to leave this area. As we do so, I believe that Stuart may have a slide of the actual building. Yeah, yeah, I'm just showing that now, these, Tom. Eva, yeah. Oh, you are, great, perfect. Yes, Absolutely yeah. so perfect. that's the Jewish community center that was the building was there, that, that was used to round up the men. And Tom, just while you're going on, I think you'll probably show that other small part of the memorial. Oh, let's do so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. continue with the lady on the bench. Exactly. And this is also part of that memorialization process. A, a person simply minding his or her own business, sitting on this bench, watching us, watching the world, watching those events of 1943. This, I would suggest, is actually very open to interpretation. School children often suggest well, this is the persons who were watching all of those events of the Third Reich, of the Holocaust unfolding and simply watching, as opposed to engaging in, for example, civil protests that these women, in particular women, were extremely brave and extremely courageous in their protest action. Perfect. Now, as but we Tom, walk, yes. So I'm just, just while you're walking on, I suppose I want to highlight to everyone just the importance. I mean, you're talking 1943, the height of Nazi power. And for the protest to, right in the centre of the Nazi centre of government, for the protest to have lasted for 10 days and for the men to be released, it, it's, it's quite amazing. It goes right against our view or our understanding of what happened during the Nazi era um, towards the Jewish population. It's very bittersweet, isn't it? As it yes. does indicate that yes. protest could be, could be of, um, of a positive for, it could be a very positive force in society. But let's go back to that 17th century and 1671 and those families arriving in from Vienna. Now, as I suggested, these persons have a trading heritage in particular, as I said, textiles. And they know that, well, if we wish to survive in Berlin as such, if we want to just prosper, it would be best if we situate ourselves, again, near a trading route. That's exactly what they do. And right here, this street, right here, the street we were on is called Rosenstrasse, well known because of the uh, women's protests. And this street is called the street to Spandau. And it was part of that trade route network of the medieval going well into the 19th century. Spandau is northwest of Berlin. And today is part of Berlin. And from Spandau, further northwest is Hamburg, also a, uh, a founding member of the Hanseatic League. The, so they're situated again on this trading route, which also doubled up as a pilgrimage route to then eventually Santiago to Compostela. Now we're just going to sort of take a little intermezzo here and Katinka and I are standing in front of the Adina apartment hotel. Let's see, can we get the, yeah, there's Adina. And in Berlin, when you all come and visit us again or for the first time here in Berlin, you may notice there's a series of these crazy bears that, <laughs> that, that are situated throughout all of Berlin. And these bears are called the buddy bears. They were a formation of the early 2000s. It was part of a UNESCO project in which then any institution, army, embassy, company, whatever, could hire artists to paint these bears, which come in five forms. And then eventually they're auctioned off for UNESCO purposes. Now they're becoming slightly, slightly less in Berlin. And this is because of the Adena and its associations with Australia. This is the buddy bear for the Adena. It obviously, the artist is obviously 
um, uh, t taking First Nation Australian heritage or Native Australian heritage in terms of the artistic work and it's called the Dream of Time. You will notice that the bear is actually upside down. That's part of it. It's part of the artistic process and that means the bear is down under. Now, the, the, I know, too cute by half. The, as we walk, and as we've said before, we are in the historical city of Berlin. The Jewish community settles within the historical city of Berlin. There is no ghetto in Berlin at any point. So there's always a wonderful moment of integration in terms of the Berlin Jewish community. Even in the Third Reich, there was no ghetto whatsoever. A ghetto is a street or a, or a small area of a town that's actually locked at night. The, and in the same time period that the uh, Jewish families arrive, the elector of Brandenburg, the one who had given them protection, argued that he wanted street lamps in his city. He said, I want really a modern city and I'm going to have street lamps in our city. And and, but he was very aware of the fact that the flames from the street lamps could actually create fires in the hay or with the hay of the animal barns and storage barns and things of that nature. So he kicked the animal barns or all barns outside of the city walls. Now at this point, Katinka and I are walking underneath a railroad bridge. And this railroad line, which is part of the commuter system here in Berlin, is actually built on the site of the Berlin city wall. So we have historically left the historical city of Berlin. We are now just outside of it where those barns ended up in the 1680s. In the 1860s, all that remained of the Berlin city wall was removed. And that meant that in the 1910s, the train lines could be built where those city walls actually stood. And this area, because of that, becomes known as the Barn Quarter. Due to its proximity to the uh, historical Jewish community, this area becomes by 1900, an area greatly associated with a 1900 Berlin Jewish community. And we're asking ourselves, well, okay, what's going on here? What's the difference? Where, where are these persons of Jewish heritage coming from? Are they all descended from those 52 families? Not necessarily. In fact, most likely, particularly here, not. What happens is the following. In 1881, there is, the, in, in the Russian Empire, Alexander II is, uh, Alexander, yeah, the second, is uh, assassinated. And this assassination attempt is blamed upon a group of, uh, <laughs> what a lovely, lovely tone to experience in the mornings of Berlin. That was the public transport. The, uh, 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 and persons of, uh, uh, this assassination is uh, blamed upon anarchists and anarchists were then considered to be very much Jewish, that there is a Jewish component to anarchy. And throughout all of the Russian Empire, and it's important to bear in mind that the Russian Empire actually extended well into today's Poland. There is an enormous series of pogroms and persecutions against those of Jewish heritage. And many will flee. And they will flee to Hamburg and to Berlin. Now, given this association with barns, this area never actually, it was never a very high rent district. So rents were re relatively reasonable. They, it was moderate here in this district. And of course, not only that, but there is already the existing infrastructure of the historical 17th century, 18th century Jewish community just on the other side of the former city walls. And one of the great moments of this area is a wonderful architectural phenomena, just right here, gold and black, the world famous Hackischen Höfe. A Höfe is a series of courtyards, okay? So Höfe is hole for courtyard in this case. Hacke 
was a general under Friedrich II. That's the name of this more official area. And the Hachsche Hofer is a wonderful series to this day of stores, of residences, of to this day even small factories, places of communal coming together, restaurants, theaters, cinemas, cabarets. And let's go and take a look at these courtyards. Now, before I carry on any further about the Hackershire courtyards, let's talk a little bit about Berlin 1900 as it is usual. And in Berlin 1900, there is a law. This law continues to this day. And it stipulates that every Berlin building must have a courtyard. And so that I have a front building that lines the city street. Then I can walk through that building to a courtyard, which in turn will be really four walls, so two lateral buildings, and then a back building. And then I can walk through the back building, what is euphemistically referred to as the garden house, and come to another courtyard. Then the same situation, two lateral houses, a garden house, and I can walk through a series of these courtyards and garden houses from one main street to the parallel street behind. And the purpose for this was to ascertain that up in the front building were living people of some real wealth. And then the further back you went in the building, in these courtyards, the, uh, uh, the living circumstances became, to a certain extent, almost desperate to the point where people in the back courtyards would have very little light, very little fresh air. They would not have their own restrooms in the apartments they are living in, but rather on the staircase, sharing them with all the other tenants in that garden house or one of the lateral buildings as well. And the courtyard only had to be big enough to allow a fire engine to be able to do an entire circle in case there is a fire in one of those back uh, uh, wings to the buildings themselves. This creates, number one, this was the intent, a lack, uh, uh, an integration of all economic classes in Berlin. So that via this system of wealthy and poorer, there is, it prohibits the creation of workers' ghettos. That was the main intent of this. However, given the fact that by 1900, they begin to recognize actually those back buildings. There's small industry in them. There's so little light. There's so little fresh air. And we notice that um, there begins to become a reform process or better, a, a reform process commences. This reform process is often led by Berlin Jewish entrepreneurs. Here, for example, you notice several things. This courtyard is actually quite large, isn't it? And not only is it large, but look at all the window space. Just thinking of all the light that can come into the rooms here. And here, what the entrepreneur does is he separates the residential from the industrial. These were places for small factories, tool and dye in particular. But at the same time, he ascertained that this was a place of community gathering. I see the word Kino. Theater, eventually, Katika will show you that as well. Cinemas, theaters, cabarets. But isn't this brickwork absolutely wonderful? So decorative and ornamental to the building in a wonderful Art Nouveau means. I'm looking here at the brown, the green that Katika must be showing. Yes, exactly. Reminding us of Brussels. It's Art Nouveau. As we look a little bit further behind me with the rectangular geometrical shapes that are so defined, I'm reminded of a Viennese Art Nouveau. And then when Katinka began her panorama, those beautiful blue against the white glaze bricking, that reminds us actually of the just newly instigated um, investigations in Babylon as well. And so I see several things here. The courtyard opens up. I see a separation of that which is the industrialized area to the residential area of these wonderful courtyard situations. And I would suggest, why don't we walk a little bit further into these courtyards themselves? The, at the Hackshire courtyards, just to so have an idea of how this is all organized and the structure. Now, one of the great emphases of the moderns, so year 1900, is health. 
And as now we have a little bit of a close-up look, you'll notice that the bricks are glazed. Oh, I don't know if you'll notice it, but you can detect that the bricks are glazed. I can feel them. They're very, very polished and smooth. And of course, with glazed bricking, then they're much easier to clean. There's a health apparatus, a hygiene apparatus that is happening here as well. So a lot of emphasis on how the human being is living. Now, in the home that was here previous to this, at this point here, lived a man in the 19th century named Abraham Geiger. And Abraham Geiger is very relevant to, a, uh, to certain reforms in Judaic thought and to Judaic living. As what Geiger was able to do, here it says, the reformer of, of Judaic thought, a historian and a theologian. And from 19, 1836 onwards, he ascertained that at the Humboldt University, which is Berlin's oldest university, there's a photo of him, that, that the rabbinical studies were as well, or better said, no longer singularly operated by synagogues themselves or particular rabbis who will then have a divinity school underneath their auspices. But with Geiger, we notice that rabbinical studies are now being offered as well by the Humboldt University in a faculty devoted to rabbinical studies so that the rabbis or the those who finish up, are not only rabbis, but they are as well official, university-recognized theologians. So, there be, so we begin to notice with Geiger a, a very real and very successful attempt at what I will call a professionalization of the rabbi as a person, as an individual, as a profession. And we often recognize professions via a certain educational standard. That's exactly what Geiger is doing there in association with what is now the Humboldt University. And as we walk, you'll notice that aesthetically things become a little bit simpler here at the Hackershöfe, and we leave that area, which is more industrialized, indicated by those large windows. Think of all that light coming into those small factories, an area that is considerably more um, residential, with the balconies, the loggia the stores as opposed to factories on the ground floor, creating a real community of an infrastructure here in the Hackshire Hofe. This is really rather wonderful. It's now you can barely get an apartment here if you wanted to, and if you did, you'd have to spend a fair bit of money. The, <laughs> to, but I see there's maybe one empty there. So if any of you want to come to Berlin, I think I see an empty apartment up there. And you could come and live here at the Hackische Hofe. Just bear in mind that in the summertime, there's loads of people coming and enjoying these courtyards much as we are as well. Actually, Tom, John, just while yep. going through it, I know myself from going through those courtyards, I can't believe, um, A, all the restaurants obviously are closed, um, yeah. and I just can't believe there's nobody around. Um, it's just so unusual. It's usually those courtyards are packed with restaurants, people dining outside. Is that the COVID restrictions they're on at the moment? It is, and thank you, Sue, for mentioning that. This is all related now. Let's say we come here at noon. It would be just as empty today um, at noon as it is right now. And this is due to the COVID restrictions, which as of today are even stricter than, the, uh, than what they were reinstigated as on the 16th of December last year. So here in Berlin, no restaurants are open. They can offer takeaway, but under very strict hygiene formulations. There are very few stores that are open. Grocery stores are open. Pharmacies are open. Bookstores are open, just to quell your intellectual curiosity. And um, um, where you buy glasses, they are open. Bicycle stores are open. And gasoline stations are open. And that's about it. And we are being discouraged from using any form of public transport. It's still operating. You saw those buses earlier. Strict, we're actually being asked to stay at home. If a company can offer home office, they must do so. In fact, this morning when I took the subway down here to, to, uh, to where we began, there was a sign that actually said that the Minister of Work for the State of Berlin is sending out security 
to check on, on offices and just make certain that nobody is in the offices, but rather is doing their home office. I don't know if they'll be punished if found to be contrary to those rules. We also have to wear masks. Now, Katink and I do not need to wear our masks, and that's only because we're outdoors and we're socially distanced, okay, and there's no one around us as well. And if you do wear a mask, they are now more or less mandating that we wear one of these FN2 masks, so a very powerful mask that would be used. In yeah, that's all right. This is just that one little section where we've lost you, Tom. It's, uh, it's all right. There we go. We just lost you during walking through that arcade, Tom. Power internet connection so with all this filigree metalwork. This is called the Rose and Courtyards resplendent in a pink that you probably won't be able to ascertain or to see. But pink is such a wonderful color for Berlin. It's probably the last color you associate with Berlin. We talked about this in September. Pink is oxidized iron. So historical Berlin often uses pink as, as a more masculine color. We see it as more feminine color, but it is the color associated with Berlin. So what we've done is a nice little walk through those Hackische courtyards, there are other arcades or courtyards of this nature here, particularly in this area here, where much of that reform process, considering person's health in particular, is instigated by a Berlin Jewish entrepreneurial class, 1900. I'm going to walk on by, but maybe Kantika will take this wonderful staircase. Isn't that lovely? This wonderful Berlin neo Rococo staircase with the gold against the green. And I'm just also going to point out um, as Katika walks a little bit behind, uh, uh, to my side and behind me just a bit, that when she walks by, maybe she'll just show you much of Berlin, 1900, is actually brick. Okay, so I see all this lovely brick here, and then the brick is given a stucco overlay, so a plaster of Paris overlay. Now, the, many of us would be aware of, for example, Oscar Schindler and the utilization and his utilization of his ceramic factory just outside of, well, today in Krakow, as a means of rescuing so many persons of Jewish heritage. Berlin is as something a little bit similar, and it centers around a man by the name of Otto Weit. And I know, let's go in here, and I know that Stuart has a few slides of Otto Weit. And Otto Weit was a person, uh, he, uh, let me begin again. Otto Weit operated a workshop for the blind. And this workshop, this work was moved into this courtyard in 1938, by which time he recognized that he could utilize his broom and brush workshop for the blind to assist persons who, who were blind, but also of Jewish heritage. And they will be working with Otto Weit. Here's a wonderful, almost mosaic-like painting of Otto Weit. They would enter in through the door, just straight ahead, and then up onto the first floor, where the actual store, or I should say the factory, actually was situated with approximately 30 seats for these persons of who are all blind, or most of whom are blind, and, um, and they are making brooms and brushes. Now, Otto Veit was selling these brooms and brushes to all sorts of persons, but also to institutions of the Third Reich, all the way over, actually, to Auschwitz. And with that, he always had permission, so to speak, oh well, yeah, permission really, to have these very skilled, very trained persons. It was his means of actually protecting these people of Jewish heritage, Berlin Jewish heritage. And at one point, they are all arrested from this building, transported to a imprisonment, at which point Veit realizes his, not his power, but his possibilities. He takes his papers. He is able to go to that place of incarceration. They are all released and he quite literally lines them all up with himself and he leads them hand in hand back to the factory 
here and then eventually home that evening. Very sadly, all of the persons who are working here on that day of the factory action, so the 27th of February, 1943, are literally collected and they will all be deported and murdered in Auschwitz and Theresienstadt. 1994, the place of Otto Weitz factory became a memorial to Otto Weitz, to those persons of Berlin Jewish heritage murdered so, so horrendously, as well as then a center of resistance education here in Berlin. Now, as I walk, Stuart may have further photos and you'll yeah. notice um, yeah, I'll just uh, show Otto Weitz. Yeah, the, the, the classic photo yeah. of the, the classic photo, the exactly. Of the, yeah, but, exactly. And Otto Weitz is sitting there, uh, surrounded by the workers, mm -hmm. and it's very obvious. Look, there are very often some blind people, limited vision people, but there's also very obviously some people who are perfectly full sighted, uh, such as this young lady down in the front. And in fact, we can even follow her. Uh, Inga, and Tom, you might want to have a talk about Inga. Well, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about her in just a sec. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. And exactly. Show, show and the, the ones of, who are, are yeah. not blind, let's put it this way, are often yeah. working in administration. They'll be taking care of the post. They'll be taking care of correspondence, things of that nature. And that's exactly what Inga Deutschkron, this really very beautiful woman in the first row, will be doing. Yeah. She also is deported to Auschwitz, but is able to escape with the help of Otto Weidt, returns to Berlin, goes back into her underground living circumstances. After the war, will move to or immigrate to the then Palestine, where she becomes a very well-known um, journalist, returning to Berlin in 1992, where she lives today. She must be nearly 100. Now, as you have looked throughout the courtyard here, you will notice, first of all, these wonderful murals of street art, so typical of Berlin. But you also notice that the buildings here are considerably less restored than, for example, in the first courtyard that we came to, really indicating to us this state of dilapidation of East Berlin, particularly this area here and other places, in the, by the year 1990. So in the former East Berlin, it was often the case that they did not take care of, and this was intentional, the historical city. They wanted people to live outside of the historical city in new towns, a new society, East Germany, East Berlin, socialism and communism, and um, so therefore new means of living. And the historical cities then, as I suggested, often go into a great amount of dilapidation. And what the city of Berlin, post-1990, and the owners here um, arrive at is to preserve the condition to a certain extent as it looked in 1990. This is one of the very few moments in today's Berlin where we see that history of the dilapidation of the East Berlin historical city. Perfect. And just, just as you leave that courtyard, I'll just show that last image, um, actually an image of inside Otto Weitz workhouse um, during the late the mid 1940s. And then also another side is what's inside the museum today, the recreation of the workhouse, giving an appreciation of what's in there. Yeah. Perfect. You can see that very well, isn't it? It's a very well documented um, workshop. Otto Weitz dies then here in Berlin in 1947. Again, in the last 30 years, a much greater con a cognition of his moments and his efforts. I'm just going to point out a new, me it's not new, but rather a means of memorialization to the uh, victims of the Holocaust that is very personal and very individualized. And this means of a memorialization is quite simply referred to as the Stolperstein. If you look down by my feet, you see that there are these bronze, you might just be able to detect there's these bronze plates in the ground. And Katika is giving us a very beautiful close-up. Now these Stolperstein, which translates literally to stumbling stones, are not meant to make you stumble physically, but rather to make you stumble mentally, emotionally, intellectually. And they are very, very individualized and very powerful means of 
memorializing individuals of the Berlin Jewish community who are murdered in the Holocaust. And I can see here a group of four, and I know that, oh, I see these very nicely. You will notice that the, the name, if you're able to read it, is Schneebaum. So there's Hermann Schneebaum, Jenny Schneebaum, their two children, Thea, and their two-year-old son, Victor, all of whom, and this information is given to us, along with their year of uh, birth and their year of being murdered. Victor was all of two years old. And you might just be walking here in Berlin, just wondering, oh, I wonder what I'll see tonight at the cinema, in the Hackische Hofe Cinema. And you look down and you are reminded of the presence of these victims. These stumbling stones are a result of one individual artist who's, here's another group of them as well. This is a little, these have been run off, or, or, or they're a little harder to read, the Butzkofer family. These persons were living here at the Hackscher that's why they're situated at this point here. They're not randomly placed. They're placed in conjunction with Loki, with the place where these individuals lived. Now, this artistic action was developed by an artist named Gunter Demnick, and he lives in Cologne. And in the very early 2000s, he began to research his place of living, the apartment where he actually lived. And he became very aware of the fact that many people in today's Germany and, and Europe live in places where Jewish families lived, from which they were deported. And he began to create a series of these small little bronze plaques with this, in a very small amount of space, a lot of information. The name for a, a married woman, her maiden name, if they can find that, the year of their birth, the year that they are deported, and the year of uh, uh, their murder in Auschwitz or other extermination camps. So on a very small bronze plate. Now, he then did something that was illegal. And that illegality was pounding the plate into what was either public property or property of the owner of, of, of the building. That was the illegality of this. And so at first, this was a, also a little bit of civil protest in the framework of memory, but at the same time then, uh, he slowly works for a legalization of this. Today, these plaques, anybody can sponsor a plaque. And, and school children are often commissioned as part of their homework to do history, to find out who was living in that building. Well, what information do we have further on the individual? Where can we begin? And how much information can we discover that Mr. Demnick then can inscribe on these plates? But the plates are gold in color. And if an artist works in this gold color, there's a sacralization moment. There's, a, there's a, um, an uplifting moment simply via, in this case, the material, the bronze, that is then polished nearly to this beautiful gold that we, gold that we have actually seen. This is very individualized. If you were to come to Berlin and explore further Berlin, you would notice that the individualized memorialization, which is now seen throughout all of Europe, and I may also add that Demnick will memorialize not only those of Jewish heritage persecuted and murdered in the Holocaust, but those of Sinti and Roma, those of persons of a religious life who were murdered in the framework of the Third Reich and these persecutions. The, and so it's really quite universal in that sense. And if, however, you come to Berlin, perhaps you will explore the, the National Holocaust Memorial, which does not use names, which does not use um, individualizations in order to emphasize, among many other things, the monumentality um, of, of this, of the Holocaust. The, and the removal of the individual in then the framework of the Holocaust, creating a number as opposed to a name. Well, I'm going to slowly turn my attention back to those 17th century wonderful Viennese Jewish families. The, 
And okay, so they arrive, they're settled, they're happening. <laughs> and of course, you know, some of them will eventually die. So they arrive and about a year later, they need to have a cemetery. And this cemetery was very, very successful. <laughs> and it had to close in 1827 due to being overfilled. They just had to close it. They then begin to see, create a series of larger cemeteries further east of where we are situated. And I'd like to explore that cemetery just a little bit with you. The you know, typical of any cemetery in historical Europe is on the other side of the city wall. So you recall, we started really in this historical city. We crossed underneath the train bridge where I said the city walls were. And on the way, uh, well on the other side, the cemetery then is created. Let's go in. Now, in 1827, as I said, the cemetery closes. Newer cemeteries are opened further east of where we are that are still being operated. The last internment here is 1844, a family that owned plots already that are able to utilize them. Eventually, the cemetery really is taken over by nature. And in 1943, the Gestapo removes, not all, but it destroys all that remained, uh, not all, but much of what remained in the cemetery itself. Now, just to give you a little bit of orientation, if we look over here to my, it's my right, you notice all of those buildings, that's the Hakusha Hirfa, that's where we were. That's where we went in that wonderful circle. Um, exploring those arcaded, I should say arcaded, but these wonderful courtyards themselves. Now, perhaps the most well-known person to be interred at this historical cemetery is Moses Mendelssohn. Now, Moses Mendelssohn is 18th century, and he he's born in Dessau. Dessau was always very well known for having a rather enlightened society. And Moses Mendelssohn, born in 1729, dies here in Berlin in 1786. And here is his great, oh, I see. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Absolutely wonderful. With the photos and the slides, and now Katika as well. Moses Mendelssohn. Now, when Moses Mendelssohn arrives here in Berlin, he's 13 years old, and he's extremely intellectual. Or let's say at this point, he's very intelligent and will become a great intellectual as well. Now, when Moses arrives, now Dessau is south of Berlin, and it's sort of southwest of Potsdam, if any of you are aware of that. And he comes up from Dessau via Potsdam, and if he's coming from that direction, he really should have entered into the city of Berlin at what was the, what was called the Leipziger Gate, okay, which is southwest on that Berlin city wall. But he's not allowed to. Nobody of Jewish heritage was allowed to. If you were of Jewish heritage, in spite of this rather enlightened presence of a Jewish community in Berlin, those who were entering into Berlin without having, without living here, without being residents in Berlin, had to walk all the way around the city wall to the northeast. So he should have entered in via the southwest, but that would have been more, much more convenient. But he has to walk all the way around to the northeast to a gate called Rosenthal gate. And there he enters into Berlin, and we know, or at least according to him, the guard asks him, why do you wish to be in Berlin? And he said, this 13-year-old young boy, really, I have come to learn in then this center of philosophy and intellectual endeavor in Berlin, courtly Berlin, of the 18th century. And boy, does he learn 13 language and everything else. Moses Mendelssohn is today and then consider as that person who enlightens the Judaic faith, combining then or, or um, looking at the Talmud, so the commentary on the Torah, in terms of enlightened principles of freedom of will. Um, the human will create uh, choices which are the best for him and things of this nature. And this begins a reformatory process in Judaic thought and thinking. Now, this is a replacement stone. This was created by the city of Berlin in the very early 1990s. And we see here uh, in the Latin script, Moses Mendelssohn. And you also notice there are these wonderful stones on the grave itself. And <laughs> you know, we are often aware of bringing a flower or something of that nature to a grave. But a flower can wilt. Its beauty can 
disappear, returning to nature as well. And a stone, and this is something that you often see in places of so Jewish-oriented uh, cemeteries, is much more permanent. It remains as a memory to then that person and the person who placed the stone um, on it. And then on this side, in Hebraic, uh, the same information, Moses Mendelssohn, but here in the acronym, in the Hebrew, here lies Moses Mendelssohn, and then carrying on where he arrives and his date of uh, death here in Berlin. If you would like to further explore Moses Mendelssohn, his glasses, his spectacles are archived and they are on display at the Berlin Jewish Museum, which opened in 2001. Now, it's in association with this space here, which is filled with memory. Just, and I think we're going to have to do this from this side here. I'm going to turn myself around, Katinka, so I'll be facing you. And should we talk maybe about the Berlin Jewish Boys School? Yeah, there we, we see it. Behind me, just behind me now, you see a white-toned building. And this building opened in 1905, and it was the Jewish Boys School, operated by the official organization called the Berlin Jew the Jewish the uh, Jewish Community of and of Berlin, and it was uh, uh, designated as a gymnasium. Okay, so a boys in this case a boys school for boys, so preparing them for a university career. Now. As we walk by, but we're going to have to be very careful because you'll notice as we walk by, there's a police presence in front of the building. Every place of Jewish heritage in Germany, not only Berlin, has a police presence in front. This is to protect the building. It's more importantly to protect the humans who are in the building itself from any form of uh, an attack or danger as such. And so they're very aware of people filming. So it's best that we do this from this area just right here. Now, if we walk by, we may notice there's a sign, or maybe, maybe, Stuart has a photo, and above the door it says the Jewish Boys School, and that is the only moment of, uh, uh, in today's Berlin, where the word Jewish is actually on the building to this day, historical building, from this day, as in the Third Reich, all, the word Jewish was removed from Berlin, if not Germany, and they sort of forgot about that sign, Presumably, they simply put some wooden boards over it, and then uh, post-1945, those boards could re be removed. The building was utilized as a, just a, a, a public school in the time of East Berlin, and post-1990, the Berlin Jewish community has received the property back. They opted a Berlin Jewish school, not only for boys, for girls as well, but that follows ideas of Moses Mendelssohn. And Moses Mendelssohn argued that if there is to be a real integration of all people creating a very harmonious society, then Jewish young people have to be at school with non-Jewish young people as well. And that is a not necessarily a prerequisite, but it is something that the school strives for in terms of its admission processes to this day. So for example, a Catholic high school, it would be similar in terms of that sort of um, idea as well. So that's the wonderful Jewish boys' school, what is now for both young men and young women. You may ask, well, was there a Jewish girls' school? Yes, there was. And that is actually in this area as well, a little bit behind where we'll be ending up um, our walk together. That building was used as a school, I may end, until the 1990s, and today it's a series of art galleries. Now associated again with this space here is, so we're outside of those cemeteries, we're outside of the cemetery walls, and if I take a look, I notice there's this rather open space right here. It's neither the cemetery nor is it the street, but then I begin to look down, and I notice there's these wonderful bricks on the, on the ground. These bricks have a very rational character to them. I should say the lines that they create are very rational. And if you look, let's say Katinka brings up the camera up towards me just a little bit further and just look behind me, or maybe you already see it. You do see it very nicely, actually. You notice there are two straight lines of these bricks. Where we are situated was actually the space of the former uh, Jewish old age home. 
instituted in 1844, this is considered to be one of the first purpose made, so to speak, um, old age homes or nursing homes in the world. Very, very modern. If you look a little bit further, you notice that every now and then, it looks like you could walk through a door. So for example, right here, this was the corridor. Walls, uh, rooms on one side, a second room here, for example, this side, you notice they open the door itself. So these brick lines give us once again, a presence, a memory to that which is no longer here, destroyed in the bomb raids of World War II, but later in about 19, well, 1944 and 1945. And in association with this old age home, which I always think is really rather very beautifully situated, now, it's important to bear in mind the cemetery was closed for business in 1827. But imagine that you, <laughs> as a rather older person is situated in the room that faces the cemetery. I will call that a very powerful memento mori. Uh, and then, so all rather efficient in that sense, but it's also a rather intergenerational as well, the placement, the Jewish boys school, the old age home and the memory associated with the cemetery. And this memory process was furthered with plans of 1988. Now, as I look at this, statuary group at this point here, I recognize that the artist Will Lemmert has created a series of female figures, really rather haggard. The shoulders are, however, um, sort of proud, I'm going to say rather proud, rather drawn back or rather stooped, okay, one or really the other. These women, rather haggard, emaciated, the clothing much bigger than the bodies themselves. At the same time, I notice all of their heads, none of the heads are bowed, but are rather diagonalized off, sunken eyes, looking into, almost in a visionary means, into an eternity. I also notice that these figures, where the stones are as well, that are placed there by individuals, are on I wonder, a, a plinth. The plinth, however, is not solid, but rather uh, it comes in a little bit. So that all of a sudden I have a slight flotational quality to the statuary or the group of the statuary as well, giving and furthering this aspect of an eternal to this memory process. And then the, the, the larger stone or series of stones that create, in essence, an altar upon which then these women have been placed. This memory process or memory, memory situation was not in association with either the cemetery or originally the old age home. Rather, it was created for a concentration camp north of Berlin called Ravensbrück. And Ravensbrück was dependent upon the much larger, more well-known Sachsenhausen. And Ravensbrück was almost exclusively female women. And this was the original memorial that was to be placed there. This would never happened. In 1994, they uh, decided to place the memorial at this position here. Um, and another memorial is created then for Robbins. Brooke, I'm seeing Katinka is making very beautiful images for us. So thank you, Katinka. I find this to be a very moving, very powerful image. And that which substantiates the utilization of this memory art at this point is the fact that in 1943, I'm just sort of walking over to this, <laughs> to these words, um, is the fact that by 1943 or in 1943, the old age home was appropriated or stolen from the Berlin Jewish community. I said 43, 42. And in 1942, the Gestapo uh, converts it into a collecting point, a Samuel Lager collecting point. And this is very typical. You recall that at the factory action moment, they, these men were incarcerated in the Berlin, uh, uh, in the Jewish Social Services Institute. Here, the uh, person's Jewish heritage will be incarcerated in the Jewish old age home. This is not only humiliating for the Berlin Jewish community, but it also, and in a very weird psychological means, facilitated the incarcerations. You are to report to the Social Services Institute. Well, I know that building. You are to report to the um, old age home on Grosse Hamburger Strasse. I know that building. And so there is this psychology 
that is being weaponized in the utilization of a series of buildings for these Samo lagers throughout Berlin that are often associated with the Berlin Jewish community. Let's do a little bit of numbers because we see the numbers here very nicely. 55,000 Berlin Jews from babies to old people were murdered in the concentration camp, in this case, extermination camps, Auschwitz and Theresienstadt, where they were transported and then in a very beastly means murdered. Never forget, defend against war and protect peace. This is from 1988. Much of the planning for this memory positioning here is from 19, uh, 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 is actually completed by the early 1990s, post unification. 1988 is a pivotal year in the memory processing in Germany, both the West Germany and East Germany. And 1988 is the 50 year commemoration of the Night of the Broken Glass, 1938, 1988. And particularly in the former East Germany, the, memor the memory to the victims of the Third Reich is related to communist victims, okay, or left wing um, persecution. They never, ever deny any form of social, other social and victim social and ethnic victim groups, but there's a concentration on that which is the political in terms of persecution. The, but with 1988 and the planning up to this, we begin to see what I would call a liberalization in, in East Germany as to whom memory is owed. And they begin to expand considerably their memory um, the memorialization systems and aesthetics to include them, those, uh, to include much more, I should say, those of, for example, a Jewish heritage. Um, yes, I see all those police and they are, we're now just standing in front of the Jewish boys school and you notice the police presence here. And um, as I said, so it's really very difficult to film that, but perhaps do it, or maybe you could tell yourself, could just Google in yeah. Jewish boys school and have a look. At okay, that. Tom, Tom, yeah. just before you head in next, is just a yeah. question just to help some orientation. The name of the street yeah. you're in. The, Gro the oh, I should have mentioned that and I apologize. Yeah. Grosse, yeah. G R O S S E, Grosse, Hamburger, think of a sandwich with a meatloaf, Strasse. So Grosse, Hamburger, Strasse. Sorry. And you recall, I said that that one trading route goes to Spandau and then over to Hamburg. This name here reminds us of that. Okay, so Grosse Hamburger Strasse. Thank you for that question. I should have mentioned that yeah. actually. And, and just before you do, do talk, I'll yeah. just explain to everyone, um, as you said earlier on, every Ju uh, Jewish institution in Germany has a police presence guard outside it, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and outside the boys' school, the police, because we obviously do a rehearsal of this tour, and we were there two days ago. And li literally, um, Tom and Mat Katinka were almost chased down the street by the police um, just because they were filming. Um, <laughs> and even though they're just on iPhones. So they've, they've got to be very cautious about um, sh showing the image of the Jewish boys school. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. Continue on, All Tom. Right. Super. Okay. Now, one of my actual favorite memory positions here in terms of its aesthetics is what is called the missing house. Now, I'm going to stand right here and I'll look into, Kat and Katika is zooming, and you notice that to my left and to my right, there are intact buildings. And, but behind me, there's literally an empty space between the two buildings. Well, I'm going to take you to the year 1930, in which year then there was actually a building there. It was an apartment building. It was part of the complex that is now to my left and my right. And that complex building was bombed heavily in 1945, so really just before the end of World War II here in Europe. And uh, post-1945, uh, the ruins are uh, disposed of, and it just remains an empty plot, literally to this day. But this empty plot carries an enormous amount of memory. And this is particularly due to the efforts of a um, French artist named Christian Boltanski, who in 1990 was here walking around East Berlin, which had a rather different atmosphere then than it does now. And if you look on the sides, it's going to be a little hard to see, but if you look on the side of the wall here behind me to my uh, 
uh, to my right, you notice that there's a whitewashed wall and on it, you may just be able to see plaques in white with black lettering. And Botonsky was able to find out who lived in which apartment in what time. And I noticed the name Portiset, that's Yugano. I see the name Brudachovsky, that sounds more Slavonic in nature. Horschner, Seyfeld, may sound a little bit more um, of, a Ger of, of, of a German or non-Jewish or non-Eastern um, heritage. So these people were not necessarily killed in World War II or murdered in the framework of the Holocaust. However, they create with their names a presence indicating to us, number one, the, 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 the multiple heritage that Berlin had and has. Portset is Huguenot, Budachowski, probably coming in from Eastern Europe at some point, the, for instance. And so giving us, once again, this typical postmodern, giving us a presence of that which is absent. Now, this is furthered by the fact that if you were to open up a German newspaper, particularly on Sunday, it can be rather depressing. On Sunday, they have the large death notices, the obituaries. And in German newspapers, the obituaries are framed. Okay, so each family might buy an obituary. And it can be quite large. It can be a whole page. And rather than having lots of biographical information, it will simply have the name of the person, his profession, what we have here as well, date of birth and day of death, and then his relatives, and that's about it. But these death notices, which can be, as I said, a whole page, it can also be 20 on one page, are all are white, black lettering, and each of them is given a framework in black. So there is a moment of a deathly, that, or an association with death noticing on then Botansky's work, though I'm not certain, nor is anyone many of them would have survived as such. Well, when in 19... Let me begin again. You will recall that I said that in that old synagogue, there were royal visits. And when the synagogue opened in 1713, the Queen of Prussia, Sophia, visits, and she helps celebrate the opening. This is a really rather extraordinary moment. And so Sophia has already established a relationship to the Berlin Jewish community. And she says, in, in that very same year, Sophia says, I want to build a church in honor of St. Sophia. And she builds this wonderful edifice behind me in this typical Prussian Baroque, um, rather, rather, I'm not going to say static, but rather, uh, certainly not with the curvilinear lines that we associate with the Viennese or Roman Baroque, a little bit more classical in its uh, art, art, architectural language. But she also had to confirm that she had enough land to create a cemetery plot surrounding the church. And so she approached the Jewish community, whose graveyard, whose cemetery was much larger than it is today, and said, can I buy some of your land? And they said, certainly. And they sell the land to Sophia on one condition, that this street, Grosse Hamburger Strasse, is always a street of great tolerance. So that the Lutheran religion is represented here. The Judaic thought and thinking is represented here. And eventually, Catholic thought and thinking and social services are represented here as well. And I'm just going to turn around, or Katika is, uh, is doing as well. And you see in the back, yeah, exactly. You see in the back a beautiful series of red brick buildings. And those red brick buildings are a Catholic hospital, have always been. So a wonderful street of tolerance, which is known for to this day. This was furthered by the fact that in the Church of St. Sophia, um, on the, the 13th of September, 1964, Martin Luther King visits East Berlin. He visits Germany, and he comes specifically to East Berlin, and he gives a very beautiful speech in the church itself. Now, before we leave this area en route to the synagogue, I'm just going to point out to you, and and Katinka will eventually panorama over. It's just wonderful. You'll notice that in the building, just very close to the church, are a series of damages to the stucco. And those damages were created in the tail end of World War II here in Berlin. They are um, created by Soviet soldiers who have encapsulated Berlin. 
They are essentially alone in Berlin. They are walking, or I should say, proceeding down to the Reichstag, which is just a mile behind me. And they are using, going street by street, street by street, and utilizing machine guns and smaller sized cannons to clear the streets of any resistance and they create then this war damaging. If you see this in Berlin, you know you're on the footsteps of those Soviet soldiers of 1945 en route to the Reichstag. And perfect. And I just love standing here. By the way, just you all see this. It might be of great um, actual beauty. Perfect. I'm just going to show you the street sign here. So just once again, get us that name here, because this is a very relevant street, the Street of Tolerance, the Grosse Hamburger Strasse. And when I stand here, not only will you have the street sign, but you should be able to see, there it is, a little dull today, but that's okay. And then in the distance, eventually, Katinka will be able to have beautiful views of the dome of the new synagogue. And the new synagogue is uh, from 1866, that's where we'll be commencing or co concluding our explorations. We'll talk a little bit more about it as we go on route to that beautiful building with that rather um, distinguished golden dome. So let's walk down the Krausnick Strasse. And Krausnick Strasse is just a wonderful, very atmospheric street. I'm just walking ahead here. And on my right hand side, I noticed there's this very, I find it quite beautiful. If you have been, if you are a modernist, if you are someone who loves, um, <laughs> let's say glass houses, I saw Stuart is going to do a lecture on, you may be rather, oh my goodness, that's too OTT, it's just over the top. This wonderful building just now here to my right. Katinka, is, yes, perfect. This is a wonderful example of Berlin domestic vernacular architecture, 1880. Nothing terribly modern about it. It's a brick building, but then given that wonderful stucco overlay that, um, that then gives the building the apparatus, or I should say the representation of being a stone building with a beautiful palatial facade. And you can imagine living in those front apartments, how really rather elegant it must have been. But the same situation, you go through, then you come to that courtyard, less decorative than what we were exploring earlier, just big enough for that fire truck itself. That's Berlin in post, let's say post 1880, what's called Gründerzeit architecture. And the Gründerzeit is the German empire and the enormous wealth that is generated in Germany by 1900, the founders, the industrialists as such. The and a second phenomena of Berlin architecture is the fact that if you look, oh, well, you could look either to the left or to the right, where Kantika is, but look down a little bit. And you'll notice there's often one window level that comes right down to the sidewalk or is right parallel to the sidewalk. These are the basements of the buildings. And these basements facing the street were often used and are, again, used as little stores. In, in the Gründerzeit time period, there'd be little pubs down there, tailors would be there, things of that nature. And behind them was the coal storage area, coal, C-O-A-L, for then the coal ovens that heated the buildings themselves. You ask, well, why are the cellars or the basements almost nearly visible? Berlin is built on a swamp. Oops, Berlin is built on a swamp. And that explains the fact that the buildings cannot become too tall in Berlin. Otherwise, they become too heavy and for the swamp. And you can't dig down too deep. Otherwise, you hit the ground water. Now, before we get to the new synagogue, let's just take a little, again, a lovely intermezzo in honor and memory of the world's first Rabbi S, Regina Jonas. And in the course of our explorations, we've been exploring Moses Mendelssohn, Abraham Geiger, these reformatory processes in Judaic thought and thinking and culture that are really instigated in Berlin. And cum not culminating, but very much part of this is that by 1935 or in 1935, we have here in Berlin the ordination of the first 
female rabbi, Regina Jonas, who had studied at that institute at the Humboldt University founded by Abraham Geiger. And she, and part of this is that she will have to do a doctorate. And her doctorate asked the question, can a woman become a rabbi? And to sum that whole thing up, the answer is yes. In 1942, if I'm not mistaken, she is then very sadly um, deported to Theresienstadt and from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz, where she is murdered in memory of Regina Jonas. In 1812, I'm going to go back into the 19th century. Let's talk a little bit about the new synagogue. In 1812, all persons of Jewish heritage in Prussia, capitalized in Berlin, are given then official citizenship. They are now able to actually be citizens of Prussia. Prior to this time, this was actually quite rare. So we begin to see post-1800, um, the um, an even greater integration of the Jewish into Prussian and German society. By 1829, all of the German nation states will have given citizenship to those of Jewish heritage. The, and this liberalizes as well professions, what profession a Jewish person could maintain. Now, prior to citizenship, most persons of Jewish heritage were working either in trading in Berlin, specifically textiles, or financing as the um, as from the medieval onwards it was actually more or less forbidden for those of Christian heritage to work in financing and that open that forced really then uh, the Jewish community to work in finances the and and that's 1812 then so opening up enormous professional possibilities and when this happens and occurs, the Berlin Jewish community really prospers. And this prosperity is then indicated to us by the fact that eventually they'll say, we like the old synagogue. We have much um, sentimental and memorial attachment to the old synagogue, but it's a little bit, as I said, a little bit subterranean. It doesn't really indicate our, prosper our, our prosperity and our confidence in ourselves. So by 18th or in 1866, they will have built and opened a new synagogue. And the new synagogue, oh, let's be very careful. Can take a, <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, and the new, oh, we've got beautiful lighting on the synagogue today. Perfect. And again, we'll stand here simply because there is a police presence. I like, uh, how's, yeah, let's go in a little bit further. The, um, and they build this magnificent structure as a main or, or let's say a focus point of the Jewish community in Berlin. Now, as you look at the building, you notice that there's a wonderful 1,000 and nights atmosphere to it. A some, somewhat, where are they going for? Or what are they looking at? when they build these synagogues of the latter half of the 19th century. A synagogue it doesn't have to, but it perhaps should indicate by architecture, Judaic thought and thinking. But synagogues as public larger buildings on main streets are really rather new phenomena. And this allows all sorts of new interpretations to occur. And the Berlin, and oftentimes this will happen in other German cities as well, they will look to the Sephardic, they will look to Alhambra, for an architectural inspiration. And as you look at it, you sort of notice this effect as well. Now, this synagogue was not destroyed in the Night of the Broken Glass. The Night of the Broken Glass is the 9th of November, 1938. And on that evening, in a choreographed event, the Storm Abteilung, the Storm, the SA, the Storm Paratroopers, are wear brown shirts come in and destroy via fire most German Jewish owned German Jewish synagogues and most German Jewish owned businesses throughout all of Germany. This synagogue survived that fate through the efforts of the chief of the police department in this area. His name is Wilhelm Kritzfeld. And when he recognized that the SA was coming down to set fire to the building for a second time, the first fire has been put out, he is down at the building as well with a letter 
in which is described that the building is protected by the orders of Bismarck, the great German unifier and transfer of the 19th century. And in one hand, he has the letter. In another hand, he has the pistol. I highly doubt the essay was impressed by the pistol, but the name Bismarck did instigate a little bit of a fear in the essay, they leave the building in peace. The building was um, firebombed in 1943 in a five-day, 24-hour raid over Berlin. Post-1945, East Berlin ascertains that the building does not fall into further dilapidation. And since 1990, the building has been restored to and renewed to its, on the exterior, its uh, uh, original aesthetic condition. If you can see, and maybe you can, if you look at that little mm -hmm. tower on the yes. far side of the building, you will yes. notice, oh yeah, maybe you can see it now in, um, in Stuart's yes. slides. Got the image. You notice as you're looking at those slides, the one to the left is much darker. It's a sandstone. It's dark. That did not be, that was not bombed in 1943. The one to the right, as you are looking, is newer sandstone. That area was more heavily damaged. That's the new construction. Today, the new synagogue is, again, a centering, a focus point of the Berlin Jewish community of Berlin, in, which is an institution organization which bands together 10 synagogues. Each synagogue is flourishing. Each synagogue can determine how it would like to examine and live principles of Judaic thought from orthodox to very liberal. This is considered to be conservative. This synagogue is operated, however, I should say, however, is again operated by, I should say, the director of it is a wonderful Rabbi S, whose name is Isa e Isa. Avenberg, I believe is her last name. She is actually converted to Judaism. She originally stu studied Lutheran theology, became very much interested in Judaic thought and thinking, converted in 2007. Not only converted, but became a rabbi. She, she brings together both genders in her new synagogue, and she is very highly admired in Berlin, period, as well as, of course, in the Berlin Jewish community, which has expanded from 1990, 2,000 members to today, at least 25,000 members. And this enormous and very rapid expansion of Berlin's Jewish community is related in particular to immigration from the former Soviet Union republics post-1990, where persons of Jewish heritage were actually being persecuted to a certain extent. And they are able to come to not only Berlin, but also to Germany. Germany creates a series of visa programs for these persons. But if you arrive into Germany via that visa program, which is now no longer existing, the German government told you, you will live in Berlin, you will live in Hamburg, you will live in Dresden or Mainz. And this created then a wonderful decentralization of this new Jewish life, culture, thought in all of Germany. Now, cutting edge Berlin is that young creatives, in particular from Israel, are coming to live in Berlin full time, experiencing Berlin as a place of creativity and tolerance. And with all of that said, both Kantika and I would like to thank all of you for your time, your attention, as we have explored Berlin, concentrating on Berlin's Jewish history and, and heritage, but also taking a little bit of time to explore architectural phenomena in Berlin as well. I know that um, we'll be opening up for questions, but just in case I don't have the opportunity to do so in a little bit later, both Kentik and I would like to wish all of you a lovely evening in Australia. A lovely, you all must be having summer in Australia. Make certain to stay healthy, everyone, and make certain to come to Berlin better sooner than later, but we'd love to have you here in Berlin. And I know that you all would enjoy Berlin and Germany as well. So thank you on my behalf, on behalf of Katinka, and of course, Academy Travel for your time and your attention. We've done a lot of exploration this morning. So thank you for that. Perfect. Tom, Super. Tom. Yeah.
Tom, yeah. as always, you are a most amazing person. I don't think you've drawn one breath in the whole hour and a half we've been going. Yeah. You've made my job. I've been superfluous sitting here like, oh, you just keep going. And it's like never anybody. But thank you. Uh, so it's fantastic. And I'm glad the blue sky has come out. Um, we, we have had just a couple, a couple of questions. And I think the more about the Hackishhoff area, the yeah. Hackish market area. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll let you answer it, but obviously uh, it is an upmarket area these days, isn't it? It's, uh, it, is, a... it is upmarket. It's yeah. upmarket. It's so close to, well, it's so cozy in there with those courtyards and things of that nature. It is upmarket, um, but it's not the most upmarket area in Berlin, okay? Um, and post-1990, it was a place where there were lots of artist studios, lots of fashion designers had their ateliers in that courtyard area, but the rents became too expensive. So they've moved on as well. So it's upmarket, but it's not the most upmarket area in Berlin. Yeah. So that's a good yeah. question. Thank you. And, and just, I, I know it's just a total aside for my own curiosity, because I know, I think about eight years ago, when I was there, property prices were going up phenomenally in Berlin because so many people were moving in. Is that continued that property has become more expensive? It has become more expensive. It has yeah. become more expensive in the last year, but I think this is due more to the pandemic. There's been, there's nothing gone down, but it's leveled off. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, are there any, actually, Jolene's asked us, are there any regulations about who can own build buildings in Berlin? Who can, um, there's, there's nothing stopping anybody from buying in Berlin, is it? No, there's nothing stopping, but you do, but, bear, but there, it can be rather bureaucratic and you will need a lawyer. Okay. Simply to yeah. do the notar the notarizations and and all that sort of thing. It's a little bit bureaucratic, but you can do it. Yeah, actually, I've got a friend who about fifteen years ago bought an apartment in Berlin. He still oh. spends about six months a year over there. Um, another, another question: had, um, in the courtyards in those apartments, yeah. uh, both Jewish and non-Jewish people lived in them, didn't they? The yes. In yeah. fact, just to clarify that, that as you had said at the very beginning, Stuart, there yeah. is never this ghetto. So there's never a one hundred percent area, or better an area in Berlin that is almost one hundred percent Jewish. At the Hakkasha area, and even this area here. At the most, and that would be about 1925, 1930, 12 percent of the population was of Jewish heritage. That's a good question. So actually, though their presence is quite comfortable and very and, 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 and um, atmospheric, they certainly at no point do they present a majority of the population, 12 percent in the Hakusha area. And in Berlin in general, in 1930, approximately four to five percent is of a Jewish heritage. Let's just do those numbers. 1933, 180, let's say 180,000 persons of Jewish heritage in Berlin. 180,000, that's about 5% of the population. In 19, by the end of World War II, there's really only about 400. 55,000 of those Berlin Jewish persons are murdered in the framework. Some of them are able to go into hiding. Most will be able to immigrate to Australia, to the United States, to England as well. So that's also a very good question. Thank you. Yeah. And, and also, I remember there was a story I can't go again, um, about an, uh, a Jewish and a non Jewish owner of a um, complex in that Hackishoff courtyard. Yeah. Yes. And I meant to talk about that. And I'm sorry for not having done so. This relates to the following The owner of the Hackishoffer, that Jewish entrepreneur actually had a, I'll call him a more financial partner who was silent. And this financial partner was non-Jewish. He was German-German. And in 1934, the Jewish entrepreneur and his family is able to leave Germany. And he sells his shares at a fair price to his partner. And the partner always saw to it that every year when the div dividends and you know, profits and things of that nature are being determined that the profits that would be related to the to the person now in exile in in the United States are sent to that person. It helped this person and his family survive in in his place of exile, which happened to be the United States. Post nineteen forty five, those two families are then expropriated by the East German government, and in nineteen ninety one, so post unification, the families are able to. They come together and they place a claim on the building. The building is returned to them. And shortly thereafter, they, as an estate, they sell the building 
to a German property developer. So that's a very beautiful story in terms of this um, uh, uh, horrendous time period of the Third Reich. Also, thank you, Stuart, for asking that question. Other questions? No, no, that, that's about it. You, you've you've yeah. covered it all. And you yeah. so again, it's been amazing. And again, showing people are probably a part of Berlin, even people who've been to Berlin before, may not have seen before. It, it's a fascinating history in that um, hackish market area. Um, it is so, an interesting yeah. area, isn't it? It's also very yes. atmospheric, both Katik yes. and I find. Very much yeah. so. Perfect, yeah. perfect. And, Great. And I'm glad that with the sun's come out, blue sky, there you go. <laughs> exactly. What more do we want? <laughs> exactly. But yeah. for you all to come to Berlin and to Germany oh, and we've... for us all to remain healthy. We'd very much love to. That's for sure. Great. Yeah. Right. Thank, thank you very much, Tom. Okay. Thank you, thank Pinker. You, it's been yeah. fabulous to see you again. We look forward to seeing you hopefully sometime very soon.